So for our final uh, tutorial this week, we are going to continue talking about uh, bringing concepts into our drawings. So the first drawing I'm going to do this week is of Taos Pueblo. And it is of a structure that has been uh, around for hundreds of years, uh, has continued to uh, be built and reinforced um, on this uh, Native American reservation in Taos, New Mexico. And uh, this tribe and these families have, have lived here for generations and continue to um, maintain this site, uh, this historical site, which um, I went to visit and took photographs a few years ago. And uh, I, I am drawing this because this is something that as a child, I always uh, dreamed of, I, I like the, the Southwest and um, adobe style buildings, pueblos. And so um, I'm going to do this drawing uh, of, of the building during, you know, the kind of that golden hour in the afternoon when the shadows are the strongest and um, kind of cast the longest um, because it's going to give it the most contrast. It's also going to, you know, really allow for each individual um, structure to kind of uh, set off from one another through shadows. And so I'm going to do, I, as you can see, I filled uh, the sky with the white pastel and then I um, added uh, the black charcoal to to give it the uh, shadows it needs. Um, you know, and, and I kind of the idea behind this is, is you know, my love of architecture, but also uh, appreciation for indigenous people and cultures and um, uh, their way of life and so forth. So, um, so as you can see, I continue to go in and add every shadow possible. Just not doing much detail right now but more just laying in my dark areas. And um, evolve the drawing a little bit further. Now I'm going to come in um, after I've added all of my dark, darkest blacks, uh, come in with um, like a medium gray to pull out some of the highlights. And I've done this entire drawing on um, a paper bag, a brown paper bag which gave me a nice neutral setting, uh, uh, neutral color um, for the landscape and for the uh, adobes itself. Um, and then it allows me to pull out highlights and, and have dark areas uh, really contrast. So it gives me a nice uh, flat setting to, uh, to build and to erase and to uh, add and to subtract. And, and there's the final drawing. I'm not going to draw the trees in the front because I think it's just going to um, kind of distract and take away from, from the beauty of the, the buildings there. Uh, so this next drawing is going to be a, a composite of, um, so here's Jay-Z and Marina Abramovich, and here's Marina Abramovich and her uh, former partner, Ule, um, doing a performance uh, called Relation in Time. So... Um, so start out with Marina and Jay-Z. This was shot in 2013 for his music video, Picasso Baby, uh, where he had a bunch of um, different artists and actors and, and um, uh, kind of cultural people, filmmakers and so forth, um, come to the gallery in New York and, and did this live performance. Uh, they turned into a music video. Um, and it featured a lot, of, yeah, a lot of different, very artistic people. And, uh, and then meanwhile, uh, this is a performance, early performance, uh, by the, the, uh, collaborative duo of Marina and, and Nule, who, uh, did numerous, um, uh, performance art pieces throughout the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, and then, uh, eventually split up and, and, uh, made solo projects. Ule, uh, unfortunately, has passed away um, recently. Um, so this is kind of a memorial to him, but also kind of this uh, creating creating a story, creating a narrative, uh, taking 
to uh, kind of um, cultural references uh, where Marina is involved, these, these two um, kind of uh, personal interactions, one with the foreheads touching and one with uh, heads uh, facing different directions but hair tied together. And so as you can see, finishing up all the little details, they did this one in colored pencil, uh, but I started it with ink. It was all with ink. Uh, and also I'm looking here having uh, the entire value scale. So she's wearing black, Ule's wearing gray, Jay-Z's wearing white, um, and, and then also representing uh, the values of their skin tones. Um, and, and working also with you know, photos from different uh, time periods, kind of trying to find an average there. So here I'm going to take uh, this piece by uh, Marcel Duchamp, which is essentially a, a stool with a, a bicycle wheel attached to it. We'll flip it upside down. And I'm going to have some fun with it. I'm going to, um, uh, you know, so this was this Dada piece created by Duchamp, um, basically saying, you know, it no longer has function if the wheel is, is upside down. The bench or the, the stool no longer has function. Um, but he liked spinning this wheel. And so, uh, so now with the wheel upside down, I'm now going to uh, try to balance uh, Marina Abramovich and, and Ule. Um, uh, doing this performance where he's holding an arrow and the, the string and she's holding the bow uh, with the arrow pointed directly towards her. And so I'm going to try to fit them balancing onto this, uh, you know, stool that's upside down uh, with a, a bicycle wheel on it. Um, you know, now connecting two pieces of uh, very famous 20, 20th century art pieces together. Um, so, uh, as you can see, filling in everything, uh, all my, my darks, again, with uh, a black marker, and then I'm going to come in and um, uh, fill in the, the background with a nice even gray tone uh, with marker, but then I'll, I'll come over with colored pencil and lighten it up a little bit and clean out the streaks. And, uh, and, and so... Uh, Come in now when I have the background done I can add the arrow uh, working out the details um, and just clean up that background so it's nice and solid but it's a good gray even gray tone this is the photo that I was uh, referencing the, the specific moment I had to bring them a little closer together um, just so that they would fit on on the, um, the stool and I had to kind of play around with their feet so it somewhat felt like they were uh, posturing themselves onto the, the bottom of the uh, legs of the, the, the stool. Then added a little shadow to just kind of make it look like there is this back wall. Uh, and, th and there you have it. So kind of compo compositing images into something new. Uh, basically, you're using um, drawing as Photoshop. So remember last week, I drew uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, Falling Water here. So I'm going to extend the drawing out farther, uh, so um, uh, farther down, but I'm also going to um, really push my uh, contrast and, and darken it up a little bit more. So come in and add some <clears throat> ink over top of everything. Uh, added some paper, so I, I taped the back of the paper. So if you don't have large enough paper, you know, combine multiple pieces of paper into one. So here now I'm bringing the waterfall down and all the foliage around on the sides of it. And I'm going to draw it in blue to make it pop out. And so uh, for your final project, if you want to incorporate a single color um, to add emphasis, I encourage that. So now I'm going to combine this with Duchamp's fountain, uh, which I drew last week. And I'm going to have this waterfall pouring into the, um, the urinal here. And so you can see here, uh, I'm going to actually do it and show, kind of like this animation, show the movement of the water. So you can actually see it coming down, hitting, uh, and then filling up, and then pouring out the front. And... Uh, 
and spilling over and filling up this uh, glass case that um, the, this piece is sitting in. And so I'm, and I'm going to show it to you from both um, profile and straight on. Uh, but as you can see, I'm, I'm uh, building it up layer, you know, layer by layer. Uh, and this is just kind of for this visual effect of the animation of uh, seeing seeing it. But also here I'm, I'm able to uh, combine a bunch of ideas. My love of art and architecture, but also my concerns about global warming, melting ice caps, rising sea levels. And, and so what you kind of see here is this dystopian uh, future of, of um, you know, the, this rising water. And, and so, um, and notice that, uh, you know, the, the plane of the, the water is going to change as it gets closer to our eye level. The front and the back are going to get closer and closer together. And just building layers, erasing, adding more blue and white highlights, filling it up. And I'm also looking at the cross contour um, because the water is going to wrap around at a flat level, um, but it's going to create that that curvature. And, and then finally, fill it all the way up. And, uh, and there you have it. So this is a little bit inspired by uh, William Kentridge, whose work I'll show you later, as well as Duchamp and Frank Lloyd Wright, and uh, Gerhard Richter as well. You know, he would he would take uh, paintings and, and uh, kind of destroy them. So here, uh, you know, last week I, I uh, drew a couple artists and their cats, and I decided to uh, further investigate artists and their cats. So here's John Cage, and we saw George O'Keefe. Uh, this is Maya Lin uh, and um, Basquiat, and so um, uh, Matisse as well. So I, I kept looking for these photos. I found Warhol, um, and I also found him with um, uh, the artist Robert Indiana, whose love sculpture I appropriated last week into Vote. So there's Robert Indiana. Uh, his cat, and uh, so I'm going to add some of these artists uh, in, together into a composite image, but I'm going to draw them on separate sheets of paper. So I already had Ai Weiwei finished, uh, so here I'm going to do Picasso, and I'm um, drawing his shirt first. His shirt is great because it's got these horizontal lines which show you the cross contour of the folds of the fabric, so I can uh, do that. And then I'm going to come in here, uh, add George O'Keefe behind his shoulder, um, because I, I don't see much of uh, her torso, so it's, it's good to kind of hide her back there. And then uh, Gustav Klimt here, um, his fabric has lots of folds and deep, deep shadows in it. Really work on that, and his scraggly hair, and uh, kind of the wrinkles in his forehead. And uh, uh, get that in there, and his cat's face. All right, so I fit three of them on one sheet of paper, and I'm going to cut them out. We're going to do uh, Dolly here um, on his own sheet of paper, uh, him with his ocelot. And I'm going to really focus on this ocelot. I did a different angle this week than I did last week. So I found this, and it shows a little bit more of the cat, uh, but still his eyes are wide open, um, very dramatic. And uh, come in, add uh, lights over top of darks, blend those all in so that it's really smooth uh, and it feels less drawn and, and feels more uh, like skin. And just build little details, final little details, and then I'm going to cut this one out um, as well. And so they'll all be individually cut out um, by their contours. I'm going to do Warhol, this kind of grainy photo of Warhol, so I'm going to have to actually uh, figure out some of the detail that's hidden, especially in the shadows and the extreme highlight, uh, figure out the, the, the cheekbone. Uh, so I'm doing all of the clothing in, in my cool tone grays of Prismacolor, and I'm doing um, the cats in like the French 
uh, greys and and the uh, the people, the the hands and the faces in my warm greys, um, just to give give a little bit of sense of difference between the two. Then here I'm going to take a side of this uh, paper bag and I'm going to cover it with the uh, compressed charcoal and the white pastel a couple times and kind of uh, blend it all out. And then I'm going to put um, some glue on the back of each individual uh, drawing. I've laid out, played around with the composition a few times so I know exactly where I want them laid out. And place them in there and get them laying flat. And so you can do this collaging of drawings. If you don't have a large sheet of paper, you can do several smaller drawings and collage them together, overlap them, um, play around with the composition um, so you have a little bit more flexibility at the end. Here I'm going to show you uh, some drawings that Andy Warhol did of cats. Uh, these are actually from uh, early in his career. Uh, he made a a book about 25 cats named Sam. So he named them all Sam. And, um, uh, you know, it's very uh, minimal line. There's quite an economy to the, the line and the amount of line he's using. Uh, and then kind of that fill of color. And um, uh, very different than what he's known for. But, um, uh, you know, I always appreciate uh, cats. This so next project is looking at the domestic workers' residence in my uh, previous apartment. Um, I thought it was a closet, but then I went to the back of it and I noticed that there was a bathroom. And, um, and I was really shocked to find out that, the, that this is where a domestic worker uh, would, would reside. It was quite small. So I started taking measurements of it. You know, it seemed more like a, a broom closet. Uh, so I, I took measurements of it, and, um, and I, I started, I'm going to lay out uh, the floor plan of this um, to kind of show, you know, just how small it is. And uh, eventually I, I, I'm, I'm trying to consider what, how I can turn this into an art project. So, you know, a lot of conceptual drawing is, is drawing out ideas, drawing out plans. So... Here's drawing out uh, literal architectural plans. Um, and, I, you know, I, I want to think about, like, when the architect was designing this building, you know, how much consideration did they give to the quality of life to someone who um, spends their entire day in this apartment and this is their only private space? So as you can see here, the space is big enough over here for one piece of luggage and then you can fit a small mat. You can't fit a whole bed because the, when the doors open, it would, uh, a bed wouldn't fit. And literally, uh, an average person, or average woman, her head would nearly touch the wall and her feet would hit the other wall. Uh, so you can see here, this entire space, that there's really, when you have the doors open, there's not much room at all. Uh, to move around, turn around, to get dressed. Um, and, and so here now I've, I've laid out this diagram uh, in Illustrator. Uh, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually, I'd like to build this uh, and have this in a gallery, the space. And so uh, I'm going to do an isometric drawing. So isometric drawings are, uh, have, have no vanishing point, have no perspective. Uh, every all all um, dimensions are the same, so there's no diminishing scale. So I turn my my plan at 45 degree angle, and now I'm going to draw vertical lines straight up, and all lines will uh, you know will will come straight up. There's no vanishing point, um, uh, and they're all going to come up exactly the same height. So when we first started doing perspective drawings, this is actually kind of what you might have imagined. Uh, these are drawings that are used for um, a lot of instructions, diagrams, uh, architectural drawings, and so forth, mechanical drawings, engineering drawings, and so forth. So here, uh, by, by doing this um, 
uh, fake perspective or, or lack of perspective. Uh, often like you would see in uh, 90s video games or like Supercell video games. Um, uh, everything is going to be the same. You know, so I'm doing the tiles on the floor and the tiles in the front and the tiles in the back are going to all be the same size. Um, so uh, it, it's not realistic, but it's the kind of drawings that uh, are done for this purpose, for these more um, literal purposes. Uh, Lego instructions, for example, are done in an isometric uh, style. So I wanted you to be able to see an example of this. Um, and also this is a conceptual drawing. This is a plan for an uh, art installation that I would like to create in a gallery. And, um, and so this will give me an idea of what I would have to build, all the walls I would have to build, two dimensions. Um, and gives you, you know, really an idea of, of exactly how small just how literally small this space is. It's, it's the size of a jail cellar, if not smaller. Um, so, you know, and, and to raise awareness is something I think that architects and society needs to consider is the quality of life of the people that work for us. Um, so I, as you may have noticed, I've been using some uh, newspaper to cover my drawing table. And I found this, uh, this, guide to the Civil War monuments and um, battlefields, uh, a tourist guide for, for looking at uh, retracing the steps of the, the U.S. Civil War, which was fought essentially to uh, by the South uh, so that they could continue to keep slaves. And I feel, you know, the slavery uh, was wrong. And I also think it's, it's also wrong to uh, memorialize uh, and uh, you know pay honor to the generals that fought to keep people enslaved and so and and in recent history a lot of these civil war monuments have come down and so here I'm taking this old newspaper and I'm going to cover it with colored pencil and I'm actually going to remove um, this this monument of Stonewall Jackson, this Confederate uh, general, and, um, and and essentially create what I think should be there, which is is nothing, just blank space. And then I'm going to come in and I'm going to kind of graffiti the side of it. And so I've decided that reparations before statuary is is what I'm going to say. So I come in. Just kind of scribble that on reparations before statuary, and that's going to be the the theme and the, the name of this series of of drawings. Um, so that one was pretty easy. It was just a silhouette, but here's a silhouette of a statue. But I've got clouds, uh, so I'm going to. I haven't spent any time really talking about drawing clouds. So clouds are really just this. Uh, fluffiness of, of shadow and highlight with highlights on the top and then these these shadows underneath and the darker the shadows you know the little bit more fierce the the clouds will look now I'm going to come in and, and finish the the building that was hidden behind uh, the statue and bring that out as though it never even existed and, and use that dark of the the shad uh, the, the statue to create shadows in the um, in the clouds and then I'm going to do this last one uh, one more of Stonewall Jackson and, and I'm going to start by working on the architecture behind him uh, so I imagine that there's another set of windows there because that's what that he was blocking the view of I'm going to bring those out and I'm going to want remember that there is still this cast shadow, so I'm going to carry that cast shadow down um, a little bit farther. Imagine kind of where it, it might end. Then bring some more windows up over top of him, so his lower half has now pretty much com been completely removed. And now I'm just trying to blend it in like nothing ever happened. And, uh, and so... Here you can see uh, going up to the sky now and, and lightening it up. 
uh, but I, I still want it to blend all the way out. So I'm going to fill in the whole sky so that it seems a lot less seamless, or it seems more seamless, less, less noticeable. And just kind of fixing the mistakes of our history. Um, and that's the idea behind these drawings. Um, so this project uh, is for Abolish 153. Um, so it's a sculpture I made of some found objects. Uh, Abolish 153 um, is, is an organization, a campaign to abolish the um, penal code, which effectively gives men regulatory, judicial, and effective power over their female kin in blatant disregard of the Constitution international agreements uh, on human and women's rights, and even uh, Sharia. This law states that any man who surprises his mother, sister, daughter, or wife in any unsavory sexual act with a man and kills her or him or both uh, will be treated as committing a misdemeanor punishable by a maximum of only three years uh, jail and or a fine of just 14 KD. So their aim is to build a coalition across the GCC and the Arab world to abolish similar laws in the region. Um, so uh, they often do fundraisers, um, art shows, um, and so I, you know, I'm submitting this work uh, to that show uh, with the hopes to uh, raise a little money and help bring attention to um, you know this cause. So. Uh, these hands are essentially coming out of the sand. So I, I, you know, I went and got sand uh, and filled up this box, painted the box, uh, painted the hands. And uh, these hands are, are kind of like um, you're waving for you know help, waving you know grasping for help. They're they're drowning, uh, buried alive, uh, so forth, and. and um, in reference to some stories we've we've heard in the recent uh, of of um, burials in the desert, so uh, it's meant to be a very kind of symbolic uh, piece um, of of kind of this this cry for help, um, and uh, it's supposed to be very anonymous. So as you see, I, I again worked on um, the brown paper bag. Uh, covered it with white pastel. I'm actually using the creases of the bag here to work as the corner of um, maybe a gallery where I would see this uh, being displayed. And, and I also see it you know, sitting on the floor uh, possibly so that we're looking down towards the ground uh, at these objects. And so here's what I would kind of submit as a proposal and... Um, uh, a plan for a conceptual piece of artwork. Um, next, I'd like to talk about two AUK graphic design alumni who um, have been making work about censorship in Kuwait. So the first one, Mohammed Alhem, uh, created The Incinerator uh, a couple years ago, and it is about uh, censored artwork. Uh, so here is what looks like a shipping container that a sculptor might use. Uh, sitting amongst wood, ready to, you know, be burnt on the fire. And then these paintings, which have all been individually covered uh, with fabric, uh, as well as uh, chains. And so a very symbolic piece, uh, kind of tackling, you know, this, this issue of censorship and what is allowed and what is not allowed in our culture was... Uh, um, available to be seen and not be seen and so and who controls that and where where is the line drawn and, and um, does a society benefit or uh, lose out from this kind of censorship so uh, you know there's very conceptual ways of um, uh, dealing with this uh, kind of literally and uh, depicting it literally but it uh, definitely goes for the most effect. Then the next artist, artist uh, is, you know, uh, graphic designer. He prefers to call himself graphic designer. Mohammed Sharif um, created the Cemetery of Banned Books. I'm going to read what he wrote. 
A few months ago, a list of more than 4,300 books banned by the government in Kuwait surfaced on Twitter. Back then, I was still living in New York, and the only thing I could think to do was create an artwork as a reaction to these arbitrary bans, which I believe to be an unacceptable level of censorship. When I moved back to Quay around the beginning of September, I noticed that activism around the subject was inconsistent. It kept coming and going from public platforms. This pushed me to try to think of something more impactful that would reach the general public and not only the small group of people invested in the subject. I thought that a public art intervention would be a good way to speak to a wider audience and to have it reach the authorities. I strongly believe in the power of unconventional forms of activism. One can raise their voice and make a point by simply standing still somewhere, or by wearing a t-shirt with a message, or by creating a cemetery of banned books. I started discussing the issue with a few friends and people who have been working around this issue, uh, the issue of bans, and after ch these chats and discussions, the idea of creating an installation during the Kuwait Annual International Book Fair crystallized. The location was important because having the installation next to the book fair meant that people heading there could see it and see the titles of the books that have been banned uh, and make their own judgment. So it was originally uh, only up for like three hours before it was taken down. And the following year, it was reinstalled uh, smaller scale at Contemporary Art Platform. So he goes on to say, in general, I am against the banning of any book. I strongly believe that people should have the option to choose for themselves what books they want to read or not. Books and literature should be available for everyone. If you think that book is not appropriate or weak or doesn't align with your values and beliefs, simply don't buy it. If you think that a book will have a negative effect on your children, don't buy it for them. That is your role as a parent, not that of the government. If the government thinks that a book is not suitable for a certain age group, it should be stated or recommended that these books should not be sold for that specific age group. In a nutshell, I think that books of any kind should be available for all. So the next artist I'd like to talk about is Wim Delvoye. He's a Belgian artist, neoconceptualist, uh, best known for his digestive machine cloaca, which translates to sewage. Um, he worked on this for eight years under the cons consultation of uh, many experts, uh, plumbers and gastroenterologists and um, uh, doctors and scientists and so forth. And uh, basically created a machine, this large machine that takes food and goes through the entire human digestive process and turns it into feces. Um, so... Uh, you know, he's, he is commenting on his love of fine dining, um, but he's also, you know, he, he created something kind of useless. Um, when asked about his inspiration, he stated that everything in modern life is pointless. The most useless object he could create was a machine that serves no purpose at all besides the reduction of food to waste. Uh, so these are all his plans, uh, mostly done in I isometric drawings. Uh, of the machines, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, some of them are in perspective as well, but, but as a conceptual artist, you have to do a lot of drawings. Uh, and he's also done murals, um, so th this is his uh, mural work, uh, but in the planning stage, uh, getting all the contours and lining everything up. He's very, very precise. Uh, everything has to be almost this like digital perfection. The next two artists I'm going to show you are a collaborative duo, John Claude and Christo, and we'll start with a little video first. Lake Iseo is about 60 miles east of Milan. And in that lake, there's a small island home to about 2,000 people. It's a population that's totally dependent on boats and ferries, and Christo, who's wrapped the Reichstag building in Berlin, who's outlined whole islands with bright pink cloth, got an idea. The project is now another seven months to go. They will walk in the water. They'll walk across the water. Yeah, they literally will walk in the water. On a path of yellow fabric on top of 200,000 plastic cubes, 
This is the first project Christo will do without his wife, Jean-Claude. She passed away in 2009. And like their past projects, the floating piers will be in place for a limited time. This project will never be repeated. Christo and his team will disassemble it after about two weeks. When the project is happening, in this very precious time for a few days, there, the people know that they're at the site of something because every human is unique in the world and they like to witness something unique. What's also unique is how these multi-million dollar projects are financed. Early on, Christo and Jean-Claude decided they needed to do things differently, out of necessity. He says collectors and dealers are notoriously slow payers. We cannot say to our workers on Friday we cannot pay them because Mr. Smith, who bought, uh, is not paying yet. In 1982, Christo and Jean-Claude formed CVJ Corporation, headquartered in Delaware. It sells Christo's original works of art from the 1950s to the present. Drawings, collages, fabric, and there's a subsidiary for each project. Right now, Christo is working on three of them, including the floating piers. Cutting or selling the fabric was very complex. Christo also buys back his artwork if he sees it on the market and thinks it's undervalued. We are now the biggest owners of works of art we have. These projects often take years. It took 24 years for Christo and Jean-Claude to get permission from New York City to do the gates from then mayor Michael Bloomberg. Has it gotten easier as you've become better known, as your project have become better known, to uh, get past the regulatory hurdles? Uh, are no. people more willing to no. have your artwork? No, no. I don't believe it how difficult. Never. No, I'm not masochist. <laughs> I would love to have an easy way. Christo keeps busy. When we spoke, he was days away from a trip to Abu Dhabi to work on another of the three projects he's juggling right now. Yellow Christo is 80, and as our interview ended, we asked him if he has even more projects planned. You know, Jean-Claude was saying, we are so young and very easily excited, and if we have a new idea, we tell you right away. And if I have a new idea, probably we will learn right away. So Christo's work you know, started very small, uh, wrapping small objects and working, you know, he worked bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, although Jean-Claude and Christo worked as a creative uh, duo, as equals, on all of their art projects, only Christo's name appeared on the finished products. Uh, and the finished drawings are essentially what funded uh, all of these large-scale uh, installations. Um, it was a conscious decision by both of them um, because they felt that there were prejudices against female artists in the art world. Uh, Jean-Claude said the decision to use only the name of Christo was made deliberately when we were young because it was difficult for one artist to be established and we wanted uh, to put all of the chances on our side. Um, so Therefore, Jean-Claude took on the role of Christo's manager. Uh, she took on the responsibility of overseeing work crews and raising funds uh, while he drew the proposal plans that you see here. Um, and, and by doing this, it was a, she, you know, they were able to work as a team and really advance their success. And the uh, pair did not reveal that Jean-Claude was considered the second half of the creative process until the mid-90s. Uh, but you can see here, you know, these large charcoal uh, drawings with a single color, you know, like orange here. Um, uh, kind of like I was doing with the falling water fountain, having this, um, you know, selected color uh, really makes it for a dramatic drawing and brings focus to that. And these are all plans. These were all drawn before the actual installation of the fabric took place. This is what uh, they used to show different government bodies to get permission for these projects uh, and also to raise all the funds needed to make these you know, very ephemeral, short-lived uh, public installations um, that you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people would come ascend upon and um, experience, essentially, for a few weeks at a time. So on this last project, the Arc de Triomphe in, in Paris, uh, is yet to be realized yet.
Uh, next artist is William Kentridge, a South African artist, best known for his uh, charcoal drawing. Johannesburg exists because gold is under the ground, invisible. It's also a city of a dichotomy between very leafy suburbs, which are man-made, to a very bleak landscape around, a complete fiction. All the mountains that are there are mountains which have been taken out of the ground from the mines. The history of the city is, of course, the history of two cities, a white city and black people living either invisibly in the city or on areas around the city. You didn't expect to see black people at the swimming pool or in the bus except at the back. How could people manage to survive in those physical conditions, but how could they survive psychically the degradation and the abuse to which they were subjected daily in a completely casual, unconsidered way by white people in South Africa. So Kentridge, you know, uh, is, is kind of unique in that he has created animations uh, from charcoal drawings. Uh, they're constructed by photographing the drawing, making uh, erasures, uh, additions, changes, um, and removing the hand, photographing, and repeating. And he continues this process very meticulously, giving each change to the drawing just a quarter to uh, half um, a second at most uh, of screen time. A single drawing will be altered and filmed uh, this way until the very end of the scene. Um, these drawings are layered, displayed along with films as finished pieces of art. Uh, so this piece, uh, taking a line for a walk, uh, consisted of, of him doing video without anything going on in the motions and then also doing a time lapse of uh, the line movement. Um, this next piece uh, is, is uh, being shown to us in reverse uh, and, and this video was actually made uh, in order to loop. Um, so as you can see here, uh, you're, you're seeing the drawing in reverse, but what he has done is he's kind of destroyed the drawing, uh, he ripped the drawing up, I uh, smudged the drawing, he, he, he took charcoal over top of it, and by now showing all of that in reverse, it looks like it's kind of coming back to life. And here, they'll do kind of a cross dissolve to the beginning before there was a drawing and step away from it, and then come back into the frame. And here, it all starts all over again. Uh, so as you can see. Um, you know, much of his work is, is very political. These uh, two pieces are a little bit more fun, but um, uh, he, he's the son of two lawyers and activists who, who spent uh, most of their time defending victims of the apartheid in South Africa. And so, um, you know, a lot of aspects of social injustice that have transpired over years in South Africa have uh, become... Uh, themes and content for uh, many of his pieces and uh, often his pieces will feature a selected color uh, often blue um, that will run through them so um, he was kind of the inspiration for making the uh, the falling water fountain that I, that I showed you filling up uh, with water and I'm not expecting you to make any kind of animation but just here to see uh, these as kind of inspirations of what is possible, um, especially as you go on as a graphic design major. The last piece I'm going to show you this semester is Moving Illustrations of Machines by Jeremy Salterbeck. He spent nearly four years perfecting the nine and a half minutes of this animation. Uh, he says, in the beginning I had no intention of creating an entire piece. I was literally playing with illustrations in two dimensions, spinning them, moving them, and seeing what could be done with the 2D abilities of the software After Effects. 
I drew the actual elements of each shot by hand, scanned them into Photoshop, animated them in After Effects, and then moved on to the next shot. So I'll leave you uh, with this final piece uh, for the end of the semester. I look forward to uh, what you put together for your final projects and how you can create the most complex uh, compositions and illustrations, um, combining all of the uh, elements that you learned throughout the semester.